New Delhi, soon to be privatized Air India Engineering Services Limited, a ESL, and Boeing me join hands to maintain the two weep Boeing 777s used by the President, VP, and PM for their medium and long haul international flights. The American aerospace major on Tuesday said it is exploring opportunities with the ESL for the maintenance, repair and overhaul MRO, of critical equipment on key Boeing defense platforms in India, including the P-8I operated by the Indian Navy and the 777 VIP aircraft operated by the Indian Air Force. The announcement was made at the Boeing India Artmanir Bharta in Defense Conference here on Tuesday. Boeing Defense India MD Surendra Ahujar said, Our planned collaboration with our ESL could position us to provide significant value add to our defense customers locally by enabling faster turnaround, exceptional operational capability, and mission readiness for the Indian Armed Forces. This is also an important step as part of our commitment to the Government of India's Atmanirabha Bharat vision of making India a regional MRO hub. A ESL CEO Shirad Agrawal said, such collaboration would drive forward our vision for strengthening MRO capabilities in India, for India. We remain excited and committed as we provide critical support to India's armed forces as part of the Boeing India Repair Development and Sustainment Birds, Hub Initiative. In a statement, Boeing said the collaboration would support the Indian Navy's growing P-8I fleet, building up the local aviation ecosystem, while ensuring quicker turnarounds for the Indian Navy. It would also help build indigenous MRO capabilities as it would bring the P-8I landing gear repair and overhaul work to India for the first time. Boeing India's collaboration with our ESL would provide further impetus to the Birds Hub initiative, an in-country network and alliance of suppliers led by Boeing in India that envisions a competitive MRO ecosystem for engineering, maintenance, skilling, repair, and sustainment services of defense and commercial aircraft. The hub has been growing capabilities in India in the areas of heavy maintenance, component repairs, and training and skilling of MRO maintainers. An important aspect of BIRDS is training programs to increase skilled manpower by developing sub-tier suppliers and medium, small and micro enterprises MSMEs, to build high-quality MRO capabilities in India, the statement said. Even the worst critics of the Bharti Ajanta Party's ideology acknowledge that it was committed to national security and a strong military befitting an emerging power. It was expected that the BJP would give utmost priority to national security and transform the armed forces for conflicts of the 21st century. Prime Minister Narendra Modi had absolute clarity on this issue when he addressed the Combined Commanders Conference on 15 December 2015. Modernization and expansion of forces at the same time is a difficult and unnecessary goal. We need forces that are agile, mobile and driven by technology, not just human valor. We need capabilities to win swift wars, for we will not have the luxury of long-drawn battles. Eight years down the line, the transformation process Modi directed to be implemented, is in disarray. There has been much rhetoric from the political and military hierarchy and the media, based on reliable sources, dutifully gave out details of numerous standalone reforms in the offing. However, despite the appointment of the Chief of Defence Staff on 31 December 2019, none of the major reforms except a policy with respect to Atmanir Bhata or self-reliance in defence equipment, which is yet to bear fruit, have fructified. The political leadership has neither owned the transformation by giving clear strategic directions and laying down the process with timelines, nor shown the drive to supervise the execution. Consequently, a bottom-up approach from a status quo military known for inter-service squabbles was adopted. Non-appointment of a CBs, who could have at least continued to coordinate this flawed approach, for five months, only proves the point. Own the transformation and correct the process. Historically, transformation of the military is politically driven. The government must carry out a long-term strategic review to evolve national security perspective 2050. From this must emerge a progressive national security strategy reviewed periodically and matched with the forecast of the GDP. This is the responsibility of the government and not the military and has been pending with the National Security Advisor since 2018. The above process will decide the size and capabilities of the armed forces.
Currently, we are engaged in incrementally reforming the armed forces tailored for wars slash conflicts of a bygone era. What we need is their transformation, top to bottom in concept and bottom to top in execution. It must be steered by an empowered committee under the defense minister. The committee should include the NSA and have a balanced representation of the military and bureaucracy, CBs, service chiefs, secretaries of defense, home and finance ministries, and domain experts. The empowered committee must prepare a vision document for transformation with timelines and firm financial commitment and get it approved by the cabinet committee on security. All contentious issues must be addressed in the vision document. Thereafter, a formal directive must be issued to the CDs to prepare detailed proposals for transformation. Parliamentary Standing Committee on Defense or a special committee must also be set up to oversee the transformation process and eventually steer the passage of a National Security Slash Defense Act. Unless the above formal and politically owned and driven process is followed, transformation of the armed forces cannot take place. An empowered CDs is essential for transformation. Having used its prerogative for merit-driven selection for higher ranks, the five months delay on part of the government in appointing the CDs is inexplicable. Five months were enough to set up a board under the defense minister to shortlist three names for the appointment through deep selection in a transparent manner for approval by the appointments committee of the cabinet. One only hopes that due to the bitter experience of the public spat between the CDs and the chief of air staff over fundamentals of air power, the government has not decided to indefinitely put the issue of tri-services integration on the back burner. Tri-service integration and creation of theater commands is sine qua non of transformation. The CDs is the linchpin for transformation. He should be an intellectual visionary, who must also have the will for execution. The conceptual anomalies with respect to the appointment must be removed. There is no such thing as first among equals and consensual decision in military command. The CDs must be formally made senior to the service chiefs if not by rank, then by appointment as is the case with chairman joint chiefs of staff in the United States. An overzealous or brash CDs can easily be kept in check by a more involved defense minister. During the transformation process, the empowered committee will resolve the CDs versus chiefs differences. The CDs must also exercise operational command over the theater commands. The role of the service chiefs must be restricted to training and administering their own service. So long as the service chiefs continue to exercise command functions, true integration of the three forces cannot take place. The operations directorates of the three services must merge with integrated defense staff, which must act as the military wing of the Department of Military Affairs DMA. There is also a need for the DMA and the Department of Defense to amalgamate with the Defense Secretary functioning under the CDs and the allocation of rules of business duly amended. How can the CDs be the single point military advisor to the government with the defense secretary being responsible for the defense of India and every part thereof, including defense policy and preparation for defense? Make a fresh start. Let there be no doubt that, so far, no tangible major reforms have taken place towards transformation of the armed forces. Indeed, a large number of standalone reforms have been conceptualized but for inexplicable reasons have not been executed. The government failed to own the transformation by not formalizing a national security strategy, issuing formal directions to the armed forces and supervising slash coordinating the execution by setting up an empowered committee under the defense minister. The armed forces do fail to rise to the occasion. They should have seized the opportunity opened by cryptic directions of the Prime Minister given during the combined commanders conferences and systematically reformed from within. More so, when the draft for the Prime Minister's speech is forwarded to the Prime Minister's office by the Chiefs of Staff Committee. The government and the military must get back to the drawing board and make a fresh start. Hong Kong, military analysts say vessel spotted in a Chinese shipyard in rare, recent satellite images could be a new or upgraded class of nuclear-powered attack submarine. It is not clear whether the submarine is a new model, an upgrade of an existing vessel or something else. But diplomats and analysts have been watching closely after a Pentagon report in November said the Chinese Navy was likely in the next few years to build a new attack submarine with vertical launch tubes for cruise missiles. 
images obtained by Reuters from private satellite imagery provider Planet Labs and others circulating on social media show the submarine in a dry dock in Huludao port in Liaoning province. Greenish covers shroud areas behind its superstructure and stern, parts of the vessel that could house missile launch tubes and a new, quieter propulsion system, analysts said. Such clear images of submarines in dry dock are seldom seen. The submarine was out of the water between April 24 and May 4, and was later seen mostly submerged in the same place after the dry dock was flooded. Singapore-based security scholar Colin Ko said there was a great deal of interest in the prospect of a new class of Chinese Type 093 Hunter killer submarine with vertical launch tubes for guided missiles. But he said the recent satellite images were too limited to definitively identify the vessel. The images are very interesting but it is still very hard to be sure yet whether we are looking at some kind of refit for testing or a whole new class of submarine, said Colin Ko of the S. Raj Ritnim School of International Studies. Colin Ko said he and others were watching closely to see whether new Chinese submarines would shift to quieter pump jets instead of conventional propellers for propulsion. Because the stern is shrouded, it is not possible to tell what sort of propulsion the ship in the image uses. Vertical launch tubes would add considerable flexibility to China's hunter-killer submarine fleet, arming the vessels with more guided missiles. The Chinese Defense Ministry did not immediately respond to Reuters' requests for comment. China's attack submarines are evolving to tackle a growing range of potential demands, from protecting ballistic missile submarines and the People's Liberation Army Navy's aircraft carrier battle groups to tracking enemy ships. Jeffrey Lewis, a professor in arms control at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, said the latest images raised more questions than answers as to whether they revealed a new class of vessel. It's plausible, but there are questions I'd want answered. It wasn't in dry dock very long and it is unclear how they may have reconfigured this submarine, he said. Given the Pentagon report, there is certainly a lot of interest. Jerusalem, the Chinese control over East Turkestan is a strategy by the Chinese government in waging a genocide and occupying the region under a false pretext of anti-terrorism. The main motto of China is eradicating the Turkic and the Uyghur peoples to ensure that East Turkestan becomes an inseparable part of China as reported by the Jerusalem Post. Earlier, after Chinese President Xi Jinping went on to achieve Chinese national rejuvenation, he imposed heinous crimes against the Turkic people. Chinese authorities sent more than 3 million Uyghurs, Kyrgyz, Cossacks and Turkic people into concentration camps as means of re-education. Those sent to the concentration camps were subjected to severe torture, slavery, forced indoctrination, rape, and also forced sterilization, stated the Jerusalem Post. According to the Chinese government, it has brought development and modernization into East Turkestan. However, in reality, the only thing that the Chinese benefited from the act was genocide, occupation, and colonization. Hundreds of Turkic and Uyghur people suffered from marginalization and abject poverty while many others have been enforced into forced labor by numerous Chinese organizations. In fact, the U.S. government has officially acknowledged China's current brutal crimes imposed upon the Uyghurs and the Turkic people, as stated in the Jerusalem Post. Moreover, the Chinese government had manipulated the global war on terror by labeling the Turkic people's struggle for freedom and external self-determination as separatism, their religious piety as extremism, and all resistance to Chinese occupation and colonization, including peaceful protests, as terrorism. Further, the Chinese government still claims that East Turkestan is a part of China itself, naming it Xinjiang, meaning new territory. However, as per historical records, East Turkestan was never a China's part and the people residing there have a long history of independence, stated the Jerusalem Post. The Chinese government has so far refused to allow independent international investigations into the crimes they committed in East Turkestan, as stated by the Jerusalem Post. However, recently, Israel also voted at the UN Human Rights Council to denounce China's crimes in East Turkestan against Uyghurs and Turkic peoples.
Tokyo, Japan appears to be gearing up for armed conflict in the East China Sea as China's invasion of Taiwan is becoming increasingly likely in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, stated a media report. After signing a security pact with the Solomon Islands, China has increased its military activities in the Pacific region, Singapore Post reported. The Solomon Islands and China last month signed the framework agreement on security cooperation that the U.S. and its allies fear could be used to establish a military base in the Pacific Island nation. Japan has started taking measures to build its strength as the Taiwan conflict flare-up will lead to its active involvement, the report said. China wooed the Solomon Islands and forced it to drop its recognition of Taiwan through assurance of investment and tourist visits. This allowed China to build a military base around 2,000 kilometers away from the country's eastern border, Singapore Post reported. It further reported that China may use similar tactics to bring other island nations in the region such as Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, and Kiribati, and Taiwan allies the Marshall Islands, Nauru and Tuvalu to its side. Meanwhile, this has upset the US and Australia. Notably, Japan is in alliance with these nations through different pacts which means Japan must join them in case an armed conflict occurs with China, said the report. Japan's relations with China are deteriorating over geopolitical tensions amid strong undercurrents of anti-China sentiments and security threats. People in Japan have already expressed their displeasure over China making claims on Sinkoku Islands, the Yaoyu Islands in Chinese. Japan's worries have amplified after the bond between China and Russia became stronger in the wake of the Ukraine invasion. Russia has already criticized Japan and suspended talks on a peace treaty for joining the international voices against it. Both countries already are in disagreement on the control over Kurlis Islands. China has been a major supporter of Russia on the Ukraine invasion. This draws Russia closer to China and certainly adds pressure on Japan, the report said. It added that Japan has taken a clear stand in the Taiwan Strait conflict and has decided to support Taiwan in case of a Chinese invasion. With the Chinese flotilla coming closer to Japanese territorial limits, Japan now will be seen showing urgency in ramping up defenses to deter and respond to possible attacks from China, Singapore Post reported. Bangalore, as part of its modernization and network-centric warfare and communications program, the Indian Navy is looking to acquire a dedicated Earth Imaging Satellite, Geo Imaging Satellite 2, GISAT 2, this fiscal. Once operational, the satellite is expected to enhance the Navy's operational capabilities in the Indian Ocean region, which is strategically and geopolitically important, especially in the backdrop of increasing Chinese presence. The Gizzard 2 is among 21 planned procurements, including some long-term acquisitions as per information from the Ministry of Defense, MOD. The capability development slash modernization of the Navy is being undertaken in accordance with the long-term plans being put in place for the next decade. The Navy has been allotted 45,250 crore for modernization under budget estimates for 2022-23. Considering a 10% year-on-year growth, it is likely to be allotted more than RS 2.7 lakh crore for modernization by 2026-27. The present total committed liabilities of the Navy is RS 1.20 lakh crore and modernization schemes for more than RS 1.9 lakh crore and RS 2.5 lakh crore, under Part A and B of the annual acquisition plan are being progressed for contract conclusion over the next five years, according to MOD. Aside from Gisar 2, the Navy will procure next-generation missile vessels, fleet support ships, FSS, high- and medium-altitude long-endurance remotely piloted aircraft systems, multi-role carrier-borne fighters, indigenous aircraft carrier 2, next-generation fast attack craft, next-generation corvettes, destroyers, fast interceptor craft and survey vessel, national hospital ship, electronic warfare system, extra-large unmanned underwater vehicle, anti-ship missiles, consolidated case for requirements up to 2030, medium-range anti-ship missile system, simulator, and missiles, Mr. Sam missiles, etc. While the mod has listed GISA-2 for procurement this fiscal, the timeline for development of the satellite and launch has not been firmed up yet. 
Among the armed forces, the Navy has been ahead when it comes to acquiring satellites. New Delhi, Pakistan through proxy militant groups in Kashmir is using local terrorists to create fear in the valley and is making all attempts to show the indigenous face of terrorism, Indian Army Chief General Manoj Pandey said on Monday. Pandey said, there is a new trend in Kashmir. Pakistan is using locals through proxy Tanzim to create fear and get visibility through media to show the indigenous face of terrorism. The army chief said the current spate of killing of non-locals, political workers and minorities is an attempt to create sensation and show that insurgency in Kashmir is indigenous. Through counter-terror operations, we have managed to neutralize such attempts and we have been successful, Pandey said. Talking about infiltration in Jammu and Kashmir, the officer said there has been improvement since 2019. The counter-infiltration grid in the valley has been successful, he said. However, Pandey said that Pakistan has started pushing in arms and ammunition and drugs through international boundary in Punjab. He added that Pakistan has been sending these through drones and it is a matter of concern which is being looked upon. In the past couple of months, the security agencies have witnessed a rise in cross-border efforts of dropping consignments of weapons and narcotics into Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir along the border using drones. In February, the Punjab government had informed the Parliamentary Committee on Home Affairs that over 130 drones have been sighted near the Pakistan border in the last two years. New Delhi, Central Intelligence Agencies have found the role of suspected overground workers of Khalistani extremists group associated with Pakistan-based terrorist, in a blast reported at Punjab Police's intelligence headquarter building in Mohali on Monday. A police official said that during the investigation they found the mobile location of a suspect associated with Pakistan-based terrorist Harwinder Singh Rinda near the blast site. We have scanned hundreds of mobile phone locations after accessing dump data of all mobile towers falling in the radius of blast site and found a number of few suspects, he said. He added that one of the numbers allegedly belonged to an overground worker associated with Rinda. Teams have been formed to catch the suspect to get more information in the case. It is also suspected that the rocket-propelled grenade, RPG, was smuggled into India from Pakistan border because Rinda was allegedly involved in smuggling of arms and ammunition from the cross border, he said. On Sunday, Punjab police had recovered an explosive device packed with around 1.5 kilograms of RDX and arrested two men in a village in Tarantaran district. The explosives were allegedly smuggled for terror activity. However, central intelligence agencies have also swung into action to get breakthroughs in the case. A senior official associated with the Central Intelligence Agency said that it is suspected that a rocket-propelled grenade, RPG, was used in the attack and it is an unusual thing. In the past, grenade attacks have happened but the use of RPGs is worrying for everyone. On May 9th, Himachal Pradesh Director General of Police issued an alert in the state in the view of Khalistani elements in neighboring states and the installing banners and graffiti of Khalistan on the outer boundary of Wuthan Sabha. He added that Punjab police has also issued an alert after the blast in Mohali. But instead of written communication, they have verbally communicated to all police officers to be on alert. According to Mohali police, a minor explosion was reported at the Punjab Police Intelligence Headquarters in Sector 77 at around 7.45 p.m. No damage has been reported. Senior officers rushed to the spot and an investigation is being done. Forensic teams have been called. On May 8, two persons were held in the Tarantaran district of Punjab. Police recovered an improvised explosive device, IED, equipped with RDX packed in a metallic box weighing over 2.5 kilograms from the two arrested. On May 5, four terror suspects were arrested in Karnal, Haryana. Police recovered three IEDs weighing 2.5 kilograms each from their possession. Bala Artral Solutions, a Chennai-based startup in the serious gaming industry, has won grants worth 3 crore from the Ministry of Defense, MOD, meant for it to work on two defense startup challenges using augmented reality, 
AR, and Virtual Reality, VR, technologies. Mr. Prem Balchandran, CEO, Bala Artral Solutions. The startup is geared up to develop, an augmented reality, R, virtual reality, VR, solution for airplane mechanics, and a VR-based training simulator for helicopter pilots, within two years, as per the mod mandate. Disc 5 winners being felicitated by Honorable Union Defense Minister, Mr. Prem representing Bala Artral Solutions, 6th from left the challenges, which attracted the entries from hundreds of companies across the country, were announced by MODS Innovations for Defense Excellence, IDX, a platform to promote innovative technologies for the Indian defense and aerospace sector. Artral has emerged among a handful of companies selected by IDX thanks to its core competencies in VR and our technologies. Announcing the grants, the Union Defense Minister felicitated the company, at a function held in New Delhi recently. In his comments, Mr. Prem Balchandran, CEO, Bala Artral Solutions, said, We are excited to have been selected for the India Defense Startup Challenges. It is a matter of pride to have the capabilities to contribute to our defense sector and a great recognition for our our slash VR competencies. Our hour slash VR solution for airplane mechanics eliminates the need for the technicians to spend hours reading through manuals with thousands of lines of instructions. The solution will display relevant audio slash visual cues for the technicians through smart glass to aid their repairing task. Our VR based simulator will eliminate the need for a real helicopter for training and evaluation. The simulator will have a virtual cockpit environment to test various capabilities of pilots such as their emergency response and cognitive loads, serving as a highly economical and effective evaluation solution. Founded in 2018, Bala Artral Solutions is a startup recognized by the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, Government of India. It is incubated at MAC 33, Bangalore, India's first business incubator developed in public-private partnership to promote innovation and entrepreneurship in aviation, aerospace and space tech. One of the focus areas of our trill is digital twin technologies that refer to virtual representation of physical objects or processes that would serve as the real-time digital environment especially for experiential learning. Talking about the benefits of serious gaming and digital twin technologies, Prem, said that the real potential of these technologies lies in their ability to provide experiential learning for the users by boosting their muscle memory and knowledge retention far better than the conventional training. We cater to different requirements from simple firefighting training using VR for corporate employees to complex flight emergencies on an airplane for seasoned pilots. All forbidden or impossible to create experiences can be provided using these digital technologies. We want to be a key player in this emerging area. Artril has developed an industrial safety platform to create customized our slash VR training solutions for employees in construction, manufacturing and processing industries. The startup has a 20-plus member team of software engineers and domain experts providing the best-in-class industrial safety and remote assist solutions. In an active partnership with Toyota Kirlos Auto Parts Private Limited, Bengaluru, Artril is providing the automobile major training digitalization solutions based on VR and R technologies. The company is also working with leading players in the aviation sector. China appears to be preparing to build a fourth aircraft carrier and new type of frigate more suited for high seas operations to complement its future carrier battle groups. Recent satellite photos revealed two FC-31's Jer Falcon stealth fighters parked alongside several J-15 Flying Shark carrier-borne fighters at the People's Liberation Army PLA, flight facility in Liaoning Province, hinting that the FC-31 may be positioned aboard China's two carriers, the Liaoning and Shandong. The joint appearance of the two types of warplanes may also hint at initial operational preparations for constructing a fourth aircraft carrier capable of operating both types of fighters. At present, the Liaoning is equipped with 26 J-15s, and the Shandong with 32 J-15 units. Neither carrier currently operates the FC-31. The fifth-generation stealth fighter was developed as a private venture by the Shenyang Aircraft Corporation SAC, and first flew in 2012. The FC-31 was also marketed for export but without any commercial success. 
in 2019, the FC-31 was rejected by the PLA Air Force in favor of the J-20 as its premier fifth-generation fighter. However, SAC hinted in early 2021 that it will accelerate the further development of the FC-31, with the jet's chief designer Sun Tung stating in a press conference that the type would indeed serve in future on China's aircraft carriers. China's third Type 003 carrier was supposed to be launched on April 23 but delays in deliveries of critical components and workforce quarantines hindered progress. Unlike the Liaoning and Shandong, China's Type 003 carrier would be equipped with an electromagnetically assisted launch system AMILS, that does not require nuclear power. Compared to traditional steam catapults, AMILs are known to be easier to operate, gentler on airframes, can launch heavier aircraft and can put more aircraft in the air in a shorter amount of time. In contrast, the Liaoning and Shandong employ an older ski ramp design, which limits the carried fuel and armament of its embarked aircraft. Some suggest these developments indicate that China is on track to building a fourth aircraft carrier. In February 2018, China State Shipbuilding Corporation CSSC, said that it has started development on a nuclear-powered carrier that would help the PLA Navy realize its strategic transformation and combat readiness capability in deep waters and open oceans by 2025. Leaked details from CSSC state that China's fourth carrier will displace between 90,000 and 100,000 tons and have AMILS catapults for getting aircraft off the deck. It'll likely carry a large air wing of J-15 fighters, J-31 stealth fighters, KJ-600 airborne early warning and control aircraft, anti-submarine warfare helicopters, and stealth attack drones. China's Type 003 carrier may thus be a transition designed from the ski ramp decks of Liaoning and Shandong to a conventionally powered AML system in the Type 003, before moving on to nuclear power. This March, the Huangpu Wenchug shipyard issued an open tender for super high-strength structural steel of the kind used in military hulls, fueling speculation that China will begin work on a new type of frigate to complement its Type 003 carrier. China's new frigate, dubbed as the Type 54B, is seen as the successor of the Type 54A. Compared to the Type 54A, Concept art of the Type 54B shows new radars and an 82 HQ 10 c Wiz missile launcher on top of the hangars. Compared to the Type 54A, the Type 54B has a bow-mounted Type 730-30mm close-in weapons system CIWS, 16 extra vertical launch systems VLS, cells mounted amidships and hangars for two helicopters. The class would also likely feature improvements in speed, range, subsystems and endurance compared to the Type 054A. China has embarked on an aggressive naval shipbuilding program to build six carrier battle groups by 2035, signaling the global expansion of its security interests, willingness to challenge long-standing US dominance in the Pacific and efforts to keep a military option against Taiwan viable. The possible construction of China's fourth aircraft carrier and Type 054B frigate underscores these objectives. Aircraft carriers are high seas combat platforms suited for expeditionary operations and allow China to overcome the limits of its current near seas defense and far seas protection naval strategy. The primary objective of near seas defense is to prepare to fight and win in the near seas, which include the Yellow Sea, East China Sea, South China Sea and areas in and around the so-called First Island Chain, or the first chain of major archipelagos reaching out from the East Asian continental mainland coast. Far Seas Protection, on the other hand, reflects China's intention to defend its critical sea lanes of communication and overseas interests in the Western Pacific and beyond. The new carrier battle groups will complement China's robust anti-access-slash-area denial capabilities within the first island chain by providing force projection capabilities into the Western Pacific for far seas protection. This month, China sent its Liaoning carrier through the Miyako Strait, a key gateway to the Western Pacific, along with four guided missile destroyers, the state-of-the-art Type 55 cruiser and a Type 901 fast combat support ship. Previously, the Liaoning Carrier Battle Group also conducted a similar deployment last year near the same location. 
With such moves, China could be signaling that its naval forces will not be contained within the first island chain by the US and its allies. China's carriers would also play a huge role in a potential invasion of Taiwan. Chinese carrier battle groups may be deployed to surround Taiwan, passing through the Miyako Strait north of the island and the Ba Shi Channel to the south. These carriers would be instrumental in enforcing a blockade against Taiwan, complement China's mainland-based combat aircraft and contribute to deterring or fighting off a U.S. intervention. However, such a naval encirclement would be a risky maneuver to execute considering China's carrier battle groups would potentially have to face Japan and the U.S. forces in the Miyako Strait north of Taiwan, as well as U.S. forces from Guam in the Bashi Channel. China is clearly cognizant of the diplomatic value of its carriers. Aircraft carriers are highly visible and flexible instruments of naval and national power capable of conveying reassurance to allies and threat of force to adversaries. They are also symbols of great power status and national prestige. While China has not yet deployed any of its two operational carriers on goodwill visits or humanitarian assistance missions, they and future units will likely be deployed for such functions in the future. China's new frigate can form part of its future carrier battle groups, complementing the larger Type 55 cruisers and Type 52D destroyers as general-purpose combatants. This may hint at a Hilo fleet plan, with the Type 54B being the low-capability ships while the Type 55s and Type 52Ds serve as the high-capability ships. As a general-purpose, mass-produced combatant, the Type 54B may perform escort duties for China's amphibious landing groups, carrier battle groups, resupply and logistics vessels, and merchant fleet while striking a balance between cost, technology, numbers and range. New Delhi, India should stop its regulatory assault on Chinese companies, state-backed Chinese newspaper Global Times said, after smartphone maker Xiaomi Corp alleged threats of physical violence in Indian investigation. Reuters reported on Saturday that Xiaomi had told an Indian court that its top executives faced threats and coercion during questioning by an Indian agency investigating illegal remittances. The agency, the Enforcement Directorate, called the allegations untrue and baseless. Citing the story, the Global Times in an opinion piece late on Sunday said the uncertainty surrounding Xiaomi's regulatory predicament should raise a red flag for India and asked New Delhi to stop its regulatory assault on Chinese companies. The impression that Chinese and other foreign companies could be intentionally targeted and suppressed isn't something good or favorable for India, it said. It is of great importance for India to maintain normal and effective communication and coordination with Chinese investors. Many Chinese companies have struggled to do business in India due to tensions following a border clash in 2020. India has cited security concerns in banning more than 300 Chinese apps since then, including TikTok, and tightened norms for Chinese companies investing in India. Global Times is a nationalistic tabloid published by the Communist Party's People's Daily. Its views do not necessarily reflect the official thinking of policymakers. The Enforcement Directorate and an Indian government spokesperson did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the Global Times view. Xiaomi, the biggest smartphone seller in India with a 24% market share and 1,500 employees, also did not respond. The directorate on April 29 seized $725 million in Xiaomi's India bank accounts, saying it made illegal remittances abroad in the guise of royalty payments. An Indian court last week put on hold the agency's decision, and the case will next be heard on May 12. Xiaomi denies any wrongdoing and says all royalty payments are legitimate. It is fair to say that Xiaomi hasn't been able to communicate effectively with Indian regulators, Global Times said. What has happened to Xiaomi could be seen as another example of India's crackdown on Chinese companies. The Washington Post in an article dated 30 April, titled, Western Artillery Surging into Ukraine Will Reshape War with Russia, quoted U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, speaking alongside his Canadian counterpart, Anita Anand, mentioning that long-range fires will prove decisive in the next phase of the war. 
US, Canada and France are providing 155mm artillery guns, ammunition as also training Ukrainian troops in using them. Thus far, Russia has been employing its long-range vectors to advantage, against Ukraine which lacked similar capabilities. Most destruction in Ukraine has been caused by Russian artillery and missiles. The US, as part of the 33 billion US dollars package to Ukraine, has promised 1,90,000 rounds of ammunition and 90 artillery guns. Ukraine has been seeking multiple barrel rocket launchers and self-propelled guns. The article adds that with both sides possessing gun locating radars, the equipment being provided must have the ability to shoot and scoot. The West hopes that a combination of javelin missile systems and long-range artillery would impede Russian progress. An update on the Ukraine war over the weekend stated that backed by the arrival of long-range artillery, Ukrainian forces have commenced an offensive in eastern Ukraine. Simultaneously, they fear a counter-barrage of Russian rockets and artillery. In added news, Germany and Netherlands would be dispatching self-propelled artillery to Ukraine to boost its firepower. One of the major lessons flowing from the war is the emergence of artillery as a decisive arm. The Russians have employed artillery, apart from its traditional roles of preparatory bombardment, close support during armed assaults and degrading enemy firepower and air defense systems, in also extricating their forces successfully from Ukrainian ambushes. Russia artillery was primarily responsible for the devastation of Mariupol. In the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict of 2020, Azerbaijan employed a combination of UAVs and artillery to target Armenia's high-value military assets, armored columns and S-300 air defense systems. UAVs were operationally integrated with the artillery to locate targets and direct artillery fire. In modern warfare the role and destructive power of the artillery is increasing. It had always been a battle-winning factor but by integrating it with UAVs, its longer ranges can be exploited to target reserves in depth while simultaneously isolating the battlefield and demoralizing the enemy. With limited use of air power in both, Ukraine and Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, the impact of joint artillery and air strikes have not been assessed. If considered together then their destructive power would be immense. When the lock with Pakistan was active, India effectively engaged Pakistan gun positions in counter-artillery strikes. The few regiments of 155mm deployed along the lock also targeted Pakistan's depth defenses, logistics dumps, HQs, terrorist launch pads and training camps. The damage led to Pak forces leaving their posts in panic. Indian artillery, which saw almost no inductions post the Bofors, is finally moving forward, though slowly. If media reports are to be believed, trials of the Danush, the Indian version of the Bofors were completed in March this year and that of the Atags, advanced towed artillery gun system early this month. Orders for both guns are expected to be issued shortly. Modernization of the Indian artillery began with the Field Artillery Rationalization Program FARP, approved in 1999. However, it faced multiple stumbling blocks due to delays in development and trials. The ultimate goal is to graduate towards 155mm guns. It must be noted that the higher the caliber, the more the weight of the shell and the greater would be its destructive power. The Indian Army has, after trials, approved the deployment of K9 Vajra self-propelled artillery guns to Ladakh. These were originally procured for mechanized operations in plains and deserts. Their redeployment would necessitate placing additional orders for employment in their initially designated roles. The activation of the northern border by China and failure to resolve the dispute resulted in India reassessing its capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China. Artillery was one area where India fell short in comparison to the PLA. The induction of the K-9 Vajra and M777 light howitzers, imported from the US, has reduced the gap considerably. However, complete upgrading to 155mm would work to Indian advantage. With the induction of UAVs, guns can be employed at longer ranges with greater accuracy. UAVs can be tasked to locate and direct guns and missiles to enable destruction of enemies' fighting capabilities. Modern drones can also be employed in isolation alongside the artillery. A combined firepower plan could prove devastating. The Indian Armed Forces must continue modernizing its artillery. 
the bribe-tainted Bofors played a key role in Cargill. Regiments were moved into the sector from different parts of the country to meet firepower requirements and they did not disappoint. Alongside guns, India needs long-range multi-barrel rocket launchers. The greater the firepower the greater is the deterrent to the enemy. With a battle-hardened and motivated infantry, supporting firepower is essential to ensure victory, as was evident in Cargill. With multiple companies, within the country, developing 155mm guns, India has the option to choose the best. Simultaneously, minor defects in the guns can be rectified during the production phase. Currently, the rate of production of the advanced weapons and equipment in India Limited, a whale, the erstwhile Ordnance Factory Board, is slow. It is their delay which led to India considering the Israeli Atis guns, procurement of which was turned down by the mod in favor for Atmanir Bhabharat. In-house development and production must be speeded up. Apart from guns, there is also a need to develop gun towers to enable speedy movement and deployment. These also need to be indigenous. Poor quality gun towers would be a setback as future artillery would need to be rapidly deployed and extricated prior to enemies' counter-strikes. With the induction of modern artillery pieces into Ukraine, the nature of conflict will change. The war will move towards artillery barrages and the force which possesses better firepower, detection and shoot and scoot capabilities would prevail. Indian armed forces must observe the emerging nature of conflict in Ukraine and upgrade its artillery accordingly. Cutting corners is not an option. Washington, condemning Russia's unprovoked, unjustifiable and illegal military aggression against Ukraine and the indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure, the G7 countries on Sunday pledged to continue imposing severe and immediate economic costs on President Putin's regime for the unjustifiable war. The strong statement came after a virtual meeting of the G7 leaders, who were joined by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. E. The leaders commemorated the end of World War II in Europe, which happened on this day in 1945, following the surrender of the German forces to the Allied powers. Seventy-seven years later, President Putin and his regime now chose to invade Ukraine in an unprovoked war of aggression against a sovereign country. His actions bring shame on Russia and the historic sacrifices of its people, the statement read. Accusing Russia of violating the international rules-based order, particularly the UN Charter, the statement called on all partners to join our, G7's, support for the Ukrainian people and for refugees, and to help Ukraine to rebuild its future. We reiterate our condemnation of Russia's unprovoked, unjustifiable and illegal military aggression against Ukraine and the indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure, which has resulted in terrible humanitarian catastrophe in the heart of Europe, the statement read. We are appalled by the large-scale loss of human life, assault on human rights, and destruction that Russia's actions have inflicted on Ukraine, the statement added. The statement also highlighted the unprecedented package of coordinated sanctions that has already significantly hindered Russia's war of aggression by limiting access to financial channels and ability to pursue their objectives. We will continue to impose severe and immediate economic costs on President Putin's regime for this unjustifiable war, the statement said, before announcing the G7's commitment to a list of five measures. We commit to phase out our dependency on Russian energy, including by phasing out or banning the import of Russian oil. We will ensure that we do so in a timely and orderly fashion, and in ways that provide time for the world to secure alternative supplies," the statement said. It added that the G7 would work with partner countries to ensure stable and sustainable global energy supplies and affordable prices for consumers as the transition from Russian energy and fossil fuels takes place. Other measures included prohibiting or preventing the provision of key services on which Russia depends to isolate Russia's economy, action against Russian banks connected to the global economy and systemically critical to the Russian financial system and imposing sanctions on additional individuals who support President Putin in his war effort. The G7 countries also pledged to continue their efforts to fight off the Russian regime's attempts to spread its propaganda. 
talking about the economic disruption caused by the war, especially the food crisis, the G7 statement said, we will address the causes and consequences of the global food crisis through a global alliance for food security, as our joint initiative to ensure momentum and coordination, and other efforts. The G7 and Ukraine stand united in this difficult time and in their quest to ensure Ukraine's democratic, prosperous future. We remain united in our resolve that President Putin must not win his war against Ukraine, the statement said. Speaking at the conference, Ukrainian President Zelensky underlined the strong resolve of Ukraine to protect its sovereignty and territorial integrity, the statement said. He stated that Ukraine's ultimate aim is to ensure full withdrawal of Russia's military forces and equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine and to secure its ability to protect itself in the future and thank G7 members for their support, the G7 statement informed. On February 24, Russia launched a military operation in Ukraine, three days after recognizing the Ukrainian breakaway regions of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent republics. The Russian Ministry of Defense maintains that the operation is targeting Ukrainian military infrastructure only. In response, Western nations imposed comprehensive sanctions against Russia. Islam Arbad, Prime Minister Shahaz Sharif said on Sunday that the Pakistan government is not in favor of any narrative against the United States and will try to improve ties with the superpower, Park Media reported. While talking to reporters in Lahore, Shahaz Sharif said that the word revenge doesn't lie in their dictionary. However, the law will find its own way. He vowed that the government will control the inflation rate soon, Ari News reported. Referring to Imran Khan's protest, Shahaz Sharif said, Interior Minister Rana Sanaullah has given Prime Minister level security to him. If Imran Khan leads a march towards Islamabad within the legal boundaries, then he will be granted permission. The law will stop them from marching toward the federal government if they give statements of bloodshed. Regarding the fresh polls in Pakistan, Prime Minister Sharif said that the final decision will be made by the coalition parties. Those who called me just an administrator are now witnessing my political moves. An electoral alliance cannot be ruled out for the next elections, Shahaz Sharif said. While answering a question of the journalist regarding Nawaz Sharif's return, Pakistan Prime Minister said that he will immediately return to the country after recovering his health. He further added that Nawaz Sharif's case is a judicial and legal affair, as reported by RE News. Earlier in the day, Imran Khan vowed to bring more than 3 million people to Islamabad after May 20 for a protest march, reported the Express Tribune. Addressing a political gathering in Nebtarbad, Imran claimed, It is my faith that no matter how many containers they will erect, more than 3 million people will reach Islamabad. Imran Khan also said that the present government is afraid of the Pakistan Tahariki and Saaf PTI, supporters' passion. He further said that the PTI supporters would reach Islamabad against the imported government, the Express Tribune reported. This nation will never accept the robbers who came to power through an American conspiracy, Khan further alleged as he tried to recall his conspiracy theory. New Delhi, the National Investigation Agency NIA, has initiated a probe into a pseudonymous Facebook account, created by Pakistani spy agency ISI, to remotely inject a concealed malware in the computers, phones and other devices of defense personnel, staff working in defense establishments and linked departments to steal sensitive information related to national security. People familiar with the development said. The account, identified as fb.com slash shanti.patel.89737, which appears in the name of Shanti Patel, contaminated the systems in order to gain unauthorized access to the restricted data of the computer resources, they added. The leak using Facebook and other apps first came to notice when Andhra Pradesh police launched an investigation into the matter based on source information in June 2020. It was one of the incidents that prompted the army to issue a directive on July 9, 2020 asking all its officers and soldiers to delete 89 social networking, microblogging and gaming apps including Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat among others from their devices. 
Nuya has now taken up the investigation on the basis of Andhra Pradesh police case to look into national and international linkages of the suspects and ramifications of data theft on the national security. One of the officers cited above said the Central Anti-Terror Probe Agency will look into the matter under Official Secrets Act (OSA), Unlawful Activities Prevention Act (UAPA), Information Technology Act and conspiracy to wage a war against India as sensitive data may have been accessed by the suspects, who worked for the ISI. It is not known yet what kind of information was accessed using the malware installed on the devices of defense personnel. Describing the modus operandi, an officer said the ISI hackers posing as Facebook Shanti Patel account befriended Indian defense personnel and then engaged with them through a private messenger chat on the internet. The suspects spread the malware by displaying them as folder with attractive photographs of women, this officer said. Investigation has revealed the malware was being spread from an unknown location in Islamabad, Pakistan. Earlier, Nuya investigated a naval spy ring run by ISI, which used social media accounts to honey trap sailors for collecting sensitive and classified information regarding locations slash movements of Indian naval ships and submarines in Eastern Naval Command at Vishakharpatnam, and other defense establishments in 2018-19. At least 15 persons were arrested in the case and a charges sheet was filed in June 2020. Koshgar, Chinese authorities have raised down the iconic Grand Bazaar in Xinjiang's Koshgar region, a media report said on Sunday. Satellite images show dramatic changes in the market, including the removal of buildings and the roofs of stalls, between photos taken on April 4 and May 4, Radio Free Asia RFA, reported citing Planet Labs Incorporated. This bazaar, which lies in the city of the Oasis, was the largest international trade market in Xinjiang, with 4,000 shops that sell more than 9,000 products on 250 acres of land. According to the report, goods from the region sold there include spices, teas, silk, dried fruit, carpets, musical instruments, Central Asia clothing and traditional skullcap. A new tourist attraction will arise in its place, RFA reported citing a local official. To make way for the new market, shops are being destroyed and their owners forced to move to a new location away from the city. The local sources told RFA that authorities are cracking down on the criticism too, detaining and interrogating vendors who voiced their displeasure with the government's decision to tear down the marketplace. Underlining the importance of the market, Qasim Chanabd Rehum, a Noigar exile based in the US who ran a shop at the bazaar from 1992 to 1998, said the bazaar served as a wholesale hub for traders from neighboring countries and the former Soviet states in Central Asia. Abd Rehum said the market became an international tourism destination for many who visited Koshgar. This market was very vibrant and most crowded, he said. It had all sorts of goods from both local traders and international producers. There's a saying about this market that anyone can find anything in this market except chicken milk, Abd Rehim added. Aiming to promote the government's quest for the Atmanirabha Bharat initiative in defense technology and reduce dependency on foreign countries, the Indian Army's Northern Command organized a two-day North Tech Symposium wherein a number of technologies were showcased at Emperor Gym. Among the technologies displayed was Vibram, Indian startup Indurair's high-efficiency dissimilar coaxial helicopter. The helicopter has been designed in collaboration with the Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur. In August 2017, Wibram won the third prize in the 34th Annual to Student Design Competition organized by the American Helicopter Society. On January 8, 2021, the design was shown to late Chief of Defense Staff General Bipin Rawat on the occasion of Army Technology Des. Later, it was displayed on January 15 on Army Des. Unmanned Drone Helicopter Wibram. Wibram is a high-endurance multi-role gasoline-powered unmanned aerial vehicle designed to meet a variety of applications. It has a two-hour hovering endurance with a day and night camera payload that can be useful for purposes like surveillance, chemical, 
biological, radiological, nuclear and high-yield explosives detection, crowd monitoring, pipeline inspection, and forest fire detection among others. It can carry 4 kilograms of payload at sea level at a speed of 70 km per hour for long-range payload delivery and surveillance from a long standoff distance. It is fitted with a fully functional and robust autopilot system. The autopilot system also includes multiple redundant fail-safe measures, which makes it a reliable tool in critical applications. The drone is said to be around 20% more efficient than the existing motor design like the traditional single main rotor and tail rotor and the regular coaxial design. It can be used by the Army and the Air Force. It consumes less fuel in comparison to traditional helicopters. Meet Team Wibram from IIT Kanpur. The team is headed by Kartik S, who is pursuing MTech while Rahul Ramanujam is the technical leader, PhD. Among other members include, Ram Das, PhD, Deeksha Agrawal, M. Tech, Sakshi Gupta, M. Tech, Avinash Shet, M. Tech, Vishesh Kumar Singh, M. Tech, and Nabakishore Rautre, M. Tech. They all are from the Aerospace Engineering Department of IIT Kanpur. The project was carried out under the guidance of Professor Venkatesan and Professor Abhishek. The symposium focused on the government's vision of self reliance in defense technologies. North Tech Symposium 2022 showcased cutting-edge technologies providing solutions to the operational challenges faced by Northern Command.